We want to have some way of understanding what reality is. Hey, humans. Hi. Hey, Quinn. Hi, Mickey. We have a real treat for you guys. We have fixed the antenna. We are finally able to talk to Earth scientists in real time using the entanglement crystal. Today, we're going to speak with Dr. Lindley, our first Earth scientist. A little bit about Dr. David Lindley. He started his career in the academic world because, you know, this is kind of how everybody starts, by going to university at Cambridge which is a really, really interesting place on Earth because it's been around since the year 1209. Dark ages. Seriously. I didn't even know they had universities then. Probably wasn't a lot. And after Dr. Lindley graduated, he went to the University of Sussex and got a Doctor of Philosophy in Astrophysics. And with his degree in hand, a newly minted Doctor of Philosophy, he came back to Cambridge, where he worked on developing mathematical theories that describe the formation of light atoms, like hydrogen, helium, and lithium. These are things we're still working on on our planet. And his work there was focused on the intersection of astrophysics, cosmology, and the atom made him an excellent candidate for the brand new theoretical astrophysics group at the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory in the United States. Yeah. So he headed over there. He certainly did. So Fermi Lab is an interesting place. They basically just smash atoms and pieces of atoms together in order to understand the multiple microscopic structures on the inside of the atom. Multiple. And in 1973, when Dr. Lindley got there, he was a founding member of the world's first research group that focused on understanding the relationship between the stars, the history of the cosmos, and the atom. After he took a long, hard look at the mysteries of the universe, and at the approaches that people were using to try to solve them, to figure them out, Dr. Lindley decided to change course a little bit, and he became a scientist of science itself. He studied other scientists and began writing. Took this editorial job at Lawrence Berkeley Labs, where he documented experiments by scientists using the superconducting super collider. Then he became an editor at the highly esteemed journal Nature, followed by a senior position at the perhaps even more highly esteemed journal Science. The two journals are the most cited journals in all of human science. That's a pretty big accomplishment. It's where the big discoveries are usually published. And after he got done there, Dr. Lindley became a full-time writer. And he's actually published six books, Mickey. Six books? Six books. His first one was published in 1993, and he called it The End of Physics. It was written in the heyday of all these untestable physics, like string theory, and was a cautionary tale of the risks that he saw that these physicists were making by mistaking elegant mathematical abstraction for reality, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, I have some bad news. He talked about it for the first time in 1993, and it seems like it's still a problem for humans today. In David Lindley's newest book, The Dream Universe, he kind of continues this line of thought by suggesting that contemporary theoretical physics is more of a philosophical practice than a scientific one. He really questions the explanatory power of exotic mathematical theories and their ability to provide engineering solutions for the practical problems you Earthlings are facing. That's it. It's yeah. a good read. So, let's talk to him. Let's do it, Mickey. You want to start the drive? 
Sure, I'll get it. Okay. Do do do. Do do do. So, so what, what, what's your background? I did a little bit of looking at you, but I wasn't quite sure. I mean, you, you're both scientists or, or were scientists? Or, or I'd like to say that we still are scientists. I think a lot of science is very mystified. A lot of science is wrapped in sort of, you know, mathematics is taken as explanation. And so there's a lot of things that happen where people think that they have explained something where in reality they've just described it. And so mm -hmm. what is the state of science? What are things that are commonly confused? How can we explain them better? And so on and so forth. That's interesting because that really, that really agrees with, with how I've come to be doing what I'm doing because I did, I spent, I, I did my PhD and then I did a couple of postdocs in cosmology and stuff like that. And I just, I mean, I enjoyed it in a way, but I just figured it somehow wasn't what I wanted to do. And uh, I started doing some writing and, as you say, one of the things I found fascinating over the years, and I've done some other books that have been sort of specifically historical about 19th century physics and so on, um, is just understanding, you know, how science progresses and how the way people think about science changes from one era to the next. And it's really, you know, it's really not something that I was taught. I don't know about you guys, but when I was learning physics, you know, you just go to your lectures and they say, well, this is what we, you know, this is, this is Maxwell's theory or this is thermodynamics or this is whatever it is. And you might get a little bit of historical anecdote about something where it came from. And usually those anecdotes are, turn out not to be true anyway. But um, yeah, you don't really get a sense of how we arrived at where we are today. And that, and that really has motivated a lot of my writing over the years and in particular, my concerns with the way this very abstruse kind of fundamental physics is going, which really does seem to just to be turning into a kind of highly mathematical philosophy more than actual science anymore. Mm -hmm. You got into this a little bit in your book, but how, how do you define science itself? Well, it's hard. I, mean, I wouldn't want to make too much of a try to precise definition, but to me, the essence of science is, I suppose, combining reason, obviously, with quantitative thinking, but also with measurement and observation. There has to be an empirical basis for it. Uh, and that, in the book, I spent quite a bit of time talking about Galileo. And in fact, I, it ended up being, I wrote more about Galileo than I was originally thinking I would because I just found him so fascinating and I'd never really dug into him and his life before. But to me, Galileo really moved on from previous thinking because he understood that you have to have a kind of logical, rational, quantitative mindset, but you also have to be looking at stuff. You know, you have to measure things and you have to observe things. So the whole idea of combining that observation with, with theorizing and then trying to find ways to see if your theorizing is accurate, it, there's really not much evidence of that before Galileo's time. And it really is, to me, the basis of how we think about science in the most general sense still today, good science anyway. How would you define philosophy then, uh, the separation between science and philosophy? Well, I'm, I'm no sort of expert on philosophy. And obviously philosophy goes, you know, it covers a great deal of ground in all kinds of areas, and moral philosophy and stuff. I mean, there's a part of philosophy which has to do with, I guess, the nature of knowledge, how we know things that we know and what do we mean by, you know, a fact or the truth and all that kind of stuff. Um, I... I don't know that science really gets into that. I mean, science, I mean, I suppose some scientists will tell you they're looking for the truth or looking for facts, but it's a little bit iffy because basically scientists, I think, are looking for things that work. They're looking for a sort of pragmatic answers to here's a process. Can we understand what's going on? Can we predict more things about it? Um, and there was a great quote from uh, Paul Dirac I came across that I used in another book. He was... Uh, I don't know if he was being interviewed or asked about philosophy, and he said, as far as science was concerned, he said, philosophy is a way of thinking about things you already know, mm. <laughs> which, <laughs> which is pretty dismissive. But, um, you know, most physicists and scientists in general tend to be kind of dismissive of philosophy, and, uh, you know, I probably have some of that. As I say, I've actually had a couple of people who've emailed me or got in touch with me to say, you know, you really should read Kant, because he did a lot of this stuff about the nature of understanding and of meaning. And uh, somebody, a friend of mine lent me a copy of, uh, what is it, The Critique of Pure Reason, and it's just been sort of sitting there 
So I probably should, I should know more about philosophy than I really do. So I probably in the in the book I'm sort of too dismissive, I suppose, of philosophy. But it does, you know. And somebody famous said that um, philosophy philosophy is all a set of footnotes to Plato or something like that. And I thought that's a weird thing to say because you know Plato, I guess, was a smart guy, but he lived an awful long time ago, and nobody would say that you know science is a set of footnotes to Newton because science moves on it kind of like assimilates its past and generates something new so the idea that philosophers are still sitting around you know two and a half thousand years later trying to sort of work out the fine points of what plato was trying to say it just seems like a strange way to carry on maybe not all philosophers would agree with that anyway so um, yeah i don't i don't really know i i should learn about philosophy more than i have but uh, i find it even the easy stuff is sort of impenetrable once you start getting into it i found so the fundamental critique is simply that these mathematical physicists are sort of going beyond nature and studying their own studies. Yeah, and in, in a sense, I think, I suppose they would try to defend it by saying that they're trying to come up with rational explanations for the way the universe is, the way particle physics is, you know, why do we have this certain set of particles and forces? How did the Big Bang start? What, why does the universe look the way it does? And, you know, those are big questions. You, c you can't ignore them. They're perfectly good questions to ask. But I, I worry that you get to a point where science, because it can't really probe empirically what's going on beyond a certain level, uh, when you start arguing about the origin of the universe and trying to come up with models for the Big Bang and how it emerges from some sort of quantum fuzziness or whatever it might be, um, you know, it sounds fine but it's hard to know how you really test those things and so a lot of what i call fundamental physics in the book has become an exercise in trying to create rational and coherent explanations for what we see about the universe but that goes so far beyond what we can see especially you get into all this multiverse stuff and the hidden dimensions and, you know, on the one hand, I can see in a sort of formal sense that, yes, that's kind of a nice explanation. It hangs together. But on the other hand, is it really science? It's trying to say, you know, it's trying to come up with an explanation that looks good to us. But, you know, we're the ones that are doing the deciding about whether it's a good explanation. It's not nature doing the deciding, so to speak. You know, when you do experiments in a lab or, or whatever else, you, you have your nice ideas, but then you put them to the test and say, is this what nature actually does? But when you start getting into all this multiverse stuff and hidden dimensions, I don't really know how you can test it. And so the question is, are you just conducting a sort of aesthetic exercise in a way saying, we really would like to have a pretty explanation and this is what we've come up with. Um, but the, the final judge of it, as I say, is, is in the, the physicist's mind rather than in nature. So that, that's the but I don't have a good alternative. I mean, as I said at the beginning, these are good questions to ask. You know, why does particle physics look the way it does? Why does the universe look the way it does? You can't, you can't not ask those questions. I just don't know how you can hope really to answer them in, in what's traditionally a scientific way. So that's kind of the, the puzzle to me. The first book that you wrote on this was in 1993, the, yeah. the end of physics. Uh, do, you, do you feel like there's a difference in how people received the end of physics versus how the dream universe has been received? Like, have people started to realize that perhaps there are issues with cosmology in a way that they didn't in the early 90s when it was still, you know, a brief history of time and cosmos and Steve Weinberg? And it, it seems like there's been a shift. Have you experienced that? I think... Um... Yeah, in terms of the atmosphere in the early 90s when I wrote The End of Physics, I think at that time that kind of physics, superstring physics and the like had been through some ups and downs, but it was still a pretty optimistic enterprise. So there were a lot of people thinking, oh, this is great. There's all these things we can do. Um, and it's gone along since then. I mean, it's a very curious thing because, you know, superstrings began basically in 1984, I think. was the So we, we're coming up to 40 years of this of this class of theories. And although the theories themselves have got a lot more sophisticated and there's been a you know obviously huge numbers of papers published and conferences and all that kind of stuff but if you ask the basic question are we any closer to actually having a theory that really does what we would like it to do 
I mean, to me, the answer is no. I mean, there are definitely much more sophisticated attempts at that, but the actual question uh, still remains unknown. And I think there are some physicists, I mean, Lee Smolin, I don't know if you know him, um, he's an American who ended up moving to Canada in this Perimeter Institute, which kind of encourages a far out thinking. And he began as a superstring theorist and then kind of became disillusioned. And he still does that kind of fundamental physics. And he has his own versions of theories he would like to explore. Um, and I think, the, you know, the general idea that, that superstring theorists are kind of running around in circles in a way, I mean, they would say that obviously, but you know, they're, they're treading this area, they're going through this ground and are they making progress in a real sense? Well, obviously they're making progress in, in constructing theories that become ever more sophisticated and now we have all these holographic universes and brains and stuff that I can barely understand. And as I say, they get, it's easy to get caught up in doing it because it's fascinating stuff if you're of that cast of mind. You know, mm -hmm. you can see someone who, who likes that stuff saying, oh, this is so cool. It's like having this play box that you can have all these things you can do. But there's when you start asking, well, how do we actually connect it back to reality? How do we connect it back to empiricism? I think there is more concern out there right now that, that this is becoming a bit of a dead end. And um, I, you know, I, I just don't know how it's going to end. I just don't know what's going to happen. I mean, the couple of reviews have said, well, maybe physicists just need to try harder and they just need to keep working. Well, that's, that's all very well, but, you know, that's what they've been doing for 40 years, and <laughs> we still don't know quite how this is going to work out. I'm sure you know Peter Voigt at, at Columbia, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. He actually gives you credit as being the first person to bring this to public attention. It really seems like back in 93, there must have been some considerable pushback when you advanced these ideas. Can you speak to that at all? Or? Well, I think, I mean, the book itself got some nice reviews and, you know, it sold a certain amount, but, you know, it hasn't made me wealthy enough yet. But <laughs> still, um, it did get some pushback. I mean, I know I heard indirectly that um, Murray Gellman was very critical of it. And uh, he, I was told by somebody I know that he had nominated me for the Ig Nobel Prize in literature, I think, for the end of physics which I thought that would be great. I would love that. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, and I think at that time, as I say, people in particle physics were thinking, you know, yes, it's just a matter of figuring out how we test these theories and, you know, we keep working. And But all the tests are very indirect, you know, that it's not that you can directly say, oh, here are some extra dimensions. You have to say, well, here's our theory with extra dimensions. And it implies this subtle change in the way particles behave. And so if we find evidence of that at the Large Hadron Collider or something, maybe that will be evidence for the extra dimensions. But it's a kind of tenuous link. You know, it's not a direct connection to say, you know, all hidden universe theories have this in common and here's how we could test it. Because they're all, you know, if things don't quite work out, there's so much mathematical complication in these theories that you can always adjust the theory if you... There was an interesting thing. I don't know if you, you must have come across Sabine Hossenfelder. Do you know her? Because she wrote this book a year or so ago, which I actually didn't find out about until I was halfway through writing mine. And she says some of the same things. Um, and she has a better understanding than I do of, of what particle physicists are up to these days. One thing I found interesting was that she said that the Large Hadron Collider, a lot of physicists hoped that it would be a real test of, of, of supersymmetry theories, which have been around for some time. Um, but she said in the book that as the LHC went on and did more experiments and it, it only just found the Higgs boson sort of at the last minute because, you know, there were parameters for the mass and so on of the Higgs boson. And, you know, it was sort of pushing to the edge of the allowed space where the Higgs boson could exist. And, and she says in her book, I think that the fact that the LHC even now has found no evidence of supersymmetry is kind of tough for those theories because it doesn't rule them out, but it means that like the simplest, nicest versions of them don't appear to work or don't appear to correspond with what we know. So you have to complicate the theories some more. And of course, the more you do that, the more it takes away from their, their fundamental attraction. It's no longer a nice, simple principle. It's something, well, we have to tweak this bit and we have to adjust that bit. And, and then 
you start to lose this sense of the sort of mathematical elegance that that drives a lot of this theorizing in the first place. So there's always a trade-off between, you know, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no. I don't mean to cut you off. I'm sorry. I thought you were done. I was just saying it sort of reminds you of the epicycles to some extent. Um, uh, you know, the, the difference and, and adding sort of more parameters and adding more parameters to the point that it works. You know, it might yeah. even work actually as a theory at some point. But it's like, is this really uh, illuminating the fundamental physical process that underlies this behavior? Yeah. I mean, the thing about the whole epicycles argument is that it wasn't intended as, as science as we would now understand it. It was meant as a geometrical model in some sense so that the church could figure out when Easter was every year and all that kind of stuff. It's, mm -hmm. it, I mean, you know, it was a way of understanding the motion of the planets and against the stellar background and so on. But because everybody had this fixation with circles, you know, everything in the heavens had to be circular. And if you say, well, we can only make these geometrical models out of circles, then it gets very complicated. And you can do it, as you say. You could, I mean, the, 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 the Ptolemaic model was actually pretty good in terms of accuracy. And one of the difficulties with Copernicus when he first came along is that he still couldn't quite get rid of circles. He, make, you know, he put the sun at the center, which was a big simplification, and made things a lot easier in some respect. But he said, oh, but we still have to have circles because those are the only allowed form of, of stellar motion. And so it wasn't until Kepler came along and said, well, hey, what about ellipses? They seem to work much better, and they do. But then, of course, you know, the, the old school at the time, I would say, oh, but ellipses, they're, you know, they're terrible, and they're not like circles. Ellipses are kind of unelegant. And so, you know, there's kind of a parallel with, the, you know, say, supersymmetry, where supersymmetry is a lot of principle. Um, but if you start insisting, well, we have to have supersymmetry because it's such a lovely principle, principle in our theories, then you have to start tweaking things around to make it work, which is, as you say, it's kind of like the epicycle argument all over again, and which, you know, which has higher priority, finding a theory that works or insisting that it be made out of fundamental principles that you've decided, oh, this must be true because it's so elegant. And, you know, again, I don't really have a good take on that because you know, elegance in some sense has been a guiding principle for, for constructing theories. You know, nobody wants theories that are ugly and awkward and kind of, you know, Rube Goldberg machines. But sometimes you just have to accept that. I, don't, I mean, it all struck me that one of the differences in, I had a friend who, who's now a science writer and she did her PhD in some kind of molecular biology way back when. And she would sometimes explain to me what she was doing. And the thing that always struck me about molecular biology and, say, the immune system, it's such a ramshackle piece. I mean, it works. It's a great thing. But nobody would say, oh, this is a beautiful, elegant piece of biochemical machinery. It's just this, it's just this weird contraption that's come about through, you know, many, many years of evolution. And it does its job. But I'm sure, you know, there, there must be molecular biologists who find, you know, elegance in it. But it seems to me, just looking at it as an outsider, it's just... As I say, it's sort of a contraption that does its job. But the question of looking for elegance, I don't know if that really comes up in molecular biology. You know, people, they're saying, well, here's this molecule. What does it do? How does it communicate? What does it attach to? And, you know, you try to tease the whole thing out. Um, so this question of elegance is something that really began to afflict physics, especially as it drew further and further away from basic empirical testing, which is what's happened, you know, in the last several decades, particularly, I think. The drift away from empirical testing in many ways seems to be a drift away from a physical understanding of the universe, where it's just like empirical testing is basically shorthand for the fact that there are objects that are doing something and you can point to them and they are behaving in a certain way. And it seems like Max Tegmark and his uh, mathemat our mathematical universe is kind of the logical conclusion of this sort of philosophical physics where you know, do you know who, who David Tong is? Uh, I don't think so, no. He's, uh, he's a quantum physicist. He gave a lecture at the Royal Institute. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, he's standing next to the desk where Faraday gave his Friday night lectures, and he's explaining to people that, like, look, everything that we know of is not made out of atoms. It's made out of quantum fields. 
And what are fields? Fields are a series of measurements that change over time. And so it seems like there's this like there's this gradual union where it's like Tegmark is still kind of looked at as being a little bit on the extreme side. Like most people, if you're like, hey, is the universe made out of math? They're going to be like, no. But if you ask a physicist, a quantum physicist, what is the universe made out of? They're going to tell you that it's made out of quantum fields whose measurements fluctuate, which sounds a lot like the universe is made out of math. As opposed to yeah, I, right, and I, I, it's it's a way of looking at things that that I mean, one thing about my own background is that even though I ended up getting into into theoretical physics and astrophysics, I was never that great at math, which is sort of a handicap in some ways because I always struggle to understand a lot of these theories. And so, um, I'll say this in the book, there, I you know my PhD involved some aspects of general relativity, and the way I thought about general relativity was not by thinking you know, starting with the properties of mathematically curved spaces in four dimensions. But, you know, in a very cartoonish way, I would think of, um, you know, a mass bends space time. You know, people sometimes say, well, put a bowling ball on a mattress and the mattress sinks and things fall towards it. And that was kind of the picture I had in mind. And it still kind of appeals to me as a basic picture. And then, you know, from that picture, you, you, you to me, at least, I, I kind of relate what the mathematics says to that kind of picture. But I think there are other people who clearly start from the other direction who basically think in mathematics first. And so um, their definition of a physical property is the mathematical statement of it. And um, in fact, years ago, I was at a, a meeting in Sicily. I was still, I think I was still, still a grad student then. I went with my advisor at the time. And they have these meetings in Eriche in Sicily, which is like summer schools and spring schools. And they had one on this whole question of particle physics and cosmology. And this is back in the sort of early ages when those fields were just beginning to come together. And so this was a meeting of cosmologists and particle physicists and some others who were sort of exploring this area where they were all starting to talk to each other. And there was a guy who was giving a lecture about um, oh, parity. And you know, parity is a basic concept in particle physics, but to those of us who are still in the sort of cosmological background, it's like parity, what's parity? And he, the guy goes on and, you know, he gave all these lectures with writing about SU2 times SU2 and blah, 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 and left hand. And my, I was sitting next to my advisor who was a sort of old school cosmologist and uh, he was getting more and more frustrated. And he said, put his hand up and said, but I still don't understand what is parity. I don't understand what parity is. And the lecturer said, he sort of looked puzzled and he, he pointed to where he'd written on the chalkboard and he said, it's SU2. And that was not really the answer that was wanted. <laughs> but there's this real, you know, I think there, is, there are some people who think primarily in mathematical terms. And as I suppose to them, like Tegmark, when you start thinking about the universe being made of mathematics, it makes some kind of sense. But I just don't know what that means. And even, you know, reading Tegmark's book, I still didn't really understand what he meant by that. And as you say, I think it's, it's further than most people would be willing to go. But on the other hand, when you talk about, well, quantum fields, what's a quantum field? It's not, it's not really a tangible thing. So we describe it using the mathematics. Um, but what actually is it? I, I don't know. And in fact, when, uh, when Maxwell came along with the electromagnetic field, that was a novelty at the time. And there were some physicists who had difficulty accepting that because it seemed to be this, it's this mathematical construct. We don't really know what it is. We can't touch it. We can't, you know, grab a piece of it. We can study its effects. And over time, because in a, in a sense, you know, the electromagnetic field is a pretty simple thing compared to all the quantum fields and whatnot we have now. So if you're a physicist, you get used to dealing with the electromagnetic field and you say, oh, well, it works this way and it causes these effects to happen and, you know, it interacts with electricity and magnetism. So it kind of takes on a certain reality in your mind because you become familiar with how it works. And I suppose if you're a, you know, a quantum physicist, then in the same way you become familiar with a quantum field because you get so used to manipulating them and doing the calculations and saying, oh, these two particles interact through this mechanism. So again, it takes on a kind of learned reality inside your head because you get so accustomed to, to thinking in those terms. 
but that doesn't really address the question of what it actually is. And I suppose a lot of physicists would say, well, you know, in a sense, physicists, physics isn't really in the business of trying to explain the nature of reality. Uh, we're just trying to figure out how things work and how they connect. But then there is this sort of hole in the middle. If you can't think of these things in physical terms, then then how do you think of them? And I mean, that's a big obstacle, I think, in a lot of the stuff. Yeah, it's interesting. A lot of physicists at that point will say, well, that's a philosophical problem. That's for the philosophers. Exactly. <laughs> Which is ironic. Yeah, uh, sense. that's always been sort of, you know, people say, oh, well, that's metaphysics. We don't care about that. But at the same time, if, if, you're, if you're trying to figure out the origin of the universe or if you're trying to figure out why there are certain sets of elementary particles or why there are super strings, well, that is metaphysics in a sense, and it's unavoidably metaphysics because um, there's, I think it was John Wheeler a long time ago, he said something to the effect that physicists should never ask why, they should only ask how. They should mm. say, how does it happen that this phenomenon occurs? And as soon as you start asking, why does this phenomenon occur? Then you're getting into sort of metaphysical stuff about, you know, why are things the way they are? But I think if you're doing this fundamental physics, you really are asking, you know, why is the universe the way it is? Mm. Why are there certain sets of fundamental particles? Um, and then you try to come up with these mathematical systems and say, well, if, if we have this nice, elegant mathematical system, it explains why we have this set of fundamental particles. But then you say, well, why is it that mathematical system and not some other mathematical system? And you say, oh, well, because it looks nice. And, you know, that's... That's sort of a metaphysical thing, whether you like it or not. It seems to me then that the whole is, what is the field? What is the fundamental particle? What are these things? It seems to me in reading the original works by Faraday that he was deeply unhappy with treating a field as a non-physical actor. I think the only reason he went along with it was that no one could show him that there was a time delay, essentially that there was some sort of medium apparent and and he was deeply committed to experimentalism i think he yeah. i think he actually said that if if someone could show that there was a time delay for gravity if someone showed him the gravitational waves today i think he would go back to his original recalcitrant position that the fields must represent something physical occurring inside of some region mm -hmm. um, yeah yeah i mean i think faraday is really one of my heroes i just think you know he was something from uh, you know, a very poor background with, with no or little formal education. And, and he wasn't by any means a mathematician. And I think that's been puzzling to a lot of physicists afterwards who couldn't quite understand how Faraday thought. And I don't claim I do either, but I think, you know, he really thought in terms of physical interactions. And so in some, in his mind, he had some sort of mental imagery for electric and magnetic effects. And there was this thing he, he referred to as the electrotonic state, which he was never able to explain clearly what it was. And I think a lot of historians of science have you know, spent a lot of time trying to figure out what he exactly meant by that. Um, but to me, it was, you know, he was really thinking of, as you say, a physical influence that spread throughout space and collect, connected electric and magnetic phenomena together. And the field that Maxwell came up with was kind of like that, but not quite, because it was more of a sort of abstract mathematical thing than maybe Faraday had in mind. Uh, but Maxwell, as I say in the book, he, he credited Faraday with being the first to think in that sort of direction. Um, but yeah, that it's an illustration. Again, it goes back to the point of people, you know, some people like to think in terms of just mathematical objects and say, well, that represents reality and that's all we need to know. But then if you're Faraday, then you want to say, but what is it really? And I suppose the mathematically minded would say, oh, you know, that's, that's metaphysics. We don't care about that. Um, but, you know, there's this, there's, this, there's this real divide, you know, and I think, I think there is sort of a hole, as you say, at the middle of it, which is we want to have some way of understanding what reality is. And this kind of physics, excuse me, is not, uh, is not giving it to us, at least not in a very easy way. I mean, one caveat to all this is we still we still don't have a unified theory of quantum mechanics and gravity. And uh, it's, it seems possible to me 
that when that comes along, assuming it comes along, it will give us a better understanding of what a quantum field actually is. Because to me, one of the big questions is, you know, in, in general relativity and gravity, there is this idea of a field in a sort of classical, almost Maxwellian sense and curved space time and all that kind of stuff. Um, but then you get to quantum mechanics and instead you have these wave functions which are sort of non-local and appear to sort of exist at all places at once, which is very contradictory. And, you know, that to me is one of the fundamental uh, discrepancies between quantum theory and classical theory is that the, the non-locality of quantum mechanics is just an impossible thing to understand. And it may be that when there's a unification of those those ways of thinking it will bring some enlightenment as to what we actually mean when we talk about space and time um because in in relativity we're still thinking about space and time in a you know in a classical sense of dimensions and you know being distinct from uh, from each other but in in quantum mechanics the whole notion of space and time becomes a little fuzzy like everything else and we don't really have a good replacement for it so you know i think that's one area where if there is some sort of unification it could enlighten us on that point um i'm not sure though even you know it, with string theory it's still this is getting into areas i don't fully understand but i think lee smolin in one of his books makes the point that in a sense string theorists are still talking about objects moving about in some sort of almost classical space a string is a little thing that wiggles around and yet we can't really define space on those dimensions, it's not clear what we mean by that. And he has his own quantum loop gravity theory, which if, again, I don't really understand it, but, but I think he's trying to think of space-time as being, you know, itself a collection of objects that sort of link together in some ways. So maybe in there, there's some sort of, maybe in that reconciliation of quantum theory and gravity, there'll be some enlightenment as to what we mean by, by space and time and matter and all that kind of stuff. But, but we certainly don't have it yet. And I think that's one of the big, empty spaces in our understanding that leads to a lot of these other difficulties that we haven't figured out yet. Mm -hmm. One last question before we go. go ahead. Um, what do you think is the, implica the implication for the future if there is not a shift in how, uh, on this sort of, uh, you know, quasi-philosophical approach to physics, right? Because you trace in your book this idea that when the, the world was a machine, there was the idler wheels and the pulleys that were used to imagine things. Now we have this theory of information and the fact that, you know, again, the fact that mathematics is what everything is made of links back to this idea that we have about information, but information doesn't actually get, it's stored in, in the form of, you know, physical objects. So if we right. make this misunderstanding of like, what is at the foundation of everything? Where does that lead us to in the future? Like, what do you see? Um, I don't know. I mean, I've thought for a while that at some point, <clears throat> excuse me, at some point, all of the people doing this highly mathematical super string theory and multi multiverses and hidden dimensions, I keep thinking at some point, aren't they just going to get bored with it? Like they're thinking, you know, they do it for years and years and years and they write all these papers and they still don't really get closer to any understanding of what of what is really, you know, uh, a theory they're looking for. But that doesn't seem to have happened. Yet. <laughs> and I think, as I said, for, for some people, the exercise itself is just, you know, it's it's so enthralling to them to play around with all these mathematical tools that, you know, you know almost the question of what they're trying to get at in the longer term becomes almost irrelevant. And, well, that's, sort of, I mean, then it really does look like philosophy because, you know, here we are, still worrying about the footnotes to Plato after, Plato after 2,000 years. And I hope theoretical physics isn't like 2,000 year, from years from now, they're still thinking, oh, we just need to tweak this theory a little bit more, understand this little detail. But I don't know, you know, Lee Smolin and others have been looking at these alternatives to, to string theory. Uh, and there are other ideas out there which tend not to get much attention because they're not so popular. Um, but at the same time, they're still fundamentally ideas based on finding some kind of mathematical model for, for reality. And, you know, I just don't know. I, I sometimes think that we're just at one of those points where, you know, to come back to this question of unification of, of quantum theory and gravity, that is, that is the big question. And I don't think we're any closer to answering it than we were 
40 years ago or so when superstring theory began. And it's just, you know, it's one of those, we, we, need, we need an Einstein, we need a Galileo, we need a Faraday to come along and say, no, you're looking at this completely wrong. Here's how it works. And could it, that could be do such come a, from mathematics? Could it come um, from mathematics like Faraday? I, I mean, my, my personal feeling is it would come from outside. It would, it would come from somebody saying, here's just a whole new conception of how we think about space and time. Because, um, you know, even Einstein, when he realized that curved space was the thing to explain gravity, he came at it not from the question of mathematics, but he, he, he sort of realized in thinking about how gravity and acceleration are similar, that, that if you think of curved space, that will do the job, maybe. But then he had to go and learn some mathematics and get some mathematics from his friends to figure out how to deal with that. Um, so, as I say, for me, what's needed is some fundamentally new conception of what we mean by space and time. And I, I have no idea. I mean, if I did have an idea of what that was, I'd be, you know, writing it up and telling the world. But I don't. Um, <laughs> and I'm old now, so it's going to be some 20-year-old who comes along and and has a new idea. I just don't know. I think we're really at sort of an impasse and, and what the breakthrough will be. I just don't know. I just don't have a good picture of what it might be. Thank you.